I will read the summary of the previous paragraph so that we have the continuity. Good. Okay. So, yes. and we have to read today from, but if accepting this side of nature. Correct. Okay. So, I am reading the summary of the previous paragraph. Mm -hmm. This manifestation of the divine on earth is a graded involution in which unity hides itself into multiplicity. The one comes down, becomes the many and hides himself in the many. Okay? Bliss reduces itself into suffering. Consciousness diminishes itself into nations. Okay? So, this is the nature of the physical world. This is the diminution of everything. So, the, this is the law of manifestation. Manifestation means forms. Forms means limitations and undivine forms. This is the law of manifestation. Perhaps there could have been other forms of manifestation, but here on our earth, this is the manifestation and the law thereof. Okay? In the physical world, it is like that. The divine is hiding here. He is not openly available to anybody. Can we say that the dualities of the world are unreal and man should learn to ignore them by becoming indifferent to them? Can we do say that? This is only partially true. We may with equal justification say that the divine, uh, sorry, that the undivine elements, falsehood, unconsciousness, suffering, perversion are real and we have to deal with them as realities. So, the first one is the Mayavadin and the Buddhistic philosophy that you have to learn to get rid of the dualities and go away from the physical world. But Srimla is saying, no, we deal with them as realities and we become master of them. That is the difference between Srimla's and Buddhist philosophy. Yeah. So, in the Buddhist philosophy, is there the sense that the word that the world is simply illusory yeah that's right that's right they say it is illusion and it is deceiving so we have to get away from the deceit and the illusion we have to go to the self which is a reality and we don't need to bother about the world because the world is permanently suffering and if you want to escape from suffering get rid of the identification with your world so but Srinu is saying we can also consider that evil, suffering, pain, falsehood, all these things are real, but we have to become master of them. That's mm -hmm. a difference. <laughs> so, now, while it is true that these perversions, as well as their opposites, are mind-created, it is true that they are mind-created, it is also true that when man is in the ignorance, they are real and have to be conquered. Okay? He has said that we have to become the master of these things which are undivine. We don't reject the undivine, but we take them as realities and we have to become master of them. So now we read further. I will read the paragraph that we have to read today. But if accepting this side of nature. Which side of nature? The negative side. The side of suffering, evil and falsehood. But if accepting this side of nature, we say that all things are fixed in their statutory and stationary law of being and man too must be fixed in his imperfections, his ignorance and sin and weakness and vileness and suffering our life loses its true significance. I am reading the whole para, then we will come back to it. We will explain. Man's perpetual attempt to arise out of darkness and insufficiency of his nature can then have no issue in the world itself, in life itself. Its one issue, if there is any, must be an escape out of life, out of the world, out of his human existence, and therefore, out of its eternally unsatisfactory law of imperfect being, 
either into a heaven of the gods or of God or into the pure ineffability of the absolute. If so, man can never really deliver out of the ignorance and falsehood the truth and knowledge, out of the evil and ugliness the good and beauty, out of the weakness and vileness the power and glory, out of the grief and suffering the joy and delight which are contained in the spirit behind them and of which these contradictions are the first adverse and contrary conditions of emergence. <clears throat> All he can do is to cut the imperfections away from him and overpass to their balancing opposites. Imperfect also, leave with the ignorance the human knowledge, with the evil the human good, with the weakness the human strength and power, with the strife and suffering, the human love and joy. For these are in our present nature inseparably entwined together, look like conjoint dualities, negative pole and positive pole of the same unreality. And since they cannot be elevated and transformed, they must be both abandoned. Humanity cannot be fulfilled in divinity. It must cease, be left behind and rejected. Whether the result will be an individual enjoyment of the absolute divine nature or of the divine presence or an nirvana in the featureless absolute is a point on which religions and philosophies differ. We'll discuss it. But in either case, human existence on earth must be taken as condemned to eternal imperfection by the very law of its being. It is perpetually and unchangeably an undivine manifestation in the existence. The soul, by taking on manhood, perhaps by the very fact of birth itself, has fallen from the divine, has committed an original sin or error, which it must be man's spiritual aim, as soon as he is enlightened, thoroughly to cancel, unflinchingly to eliminate. It's a little complicated and I was, it was, um, I was going very slow because the computer was jumping, okay? So, now... I have some question. I have a question or two. Um, pre prior to Sri Aurobindo's coming yeah. and teaching us, yes, it does seem like Buddhism yeah. uh, has a real point, a valid point. Why, why fool around with all this evil and suffering when one can totally merge into the divine? Okay, so that is the one view which is okay if you are thinking only of the suffering. If you want for the individual, okay, Srivamdu's so thinking is like this. Your question is a very valid one. You, the individual disappears into the infinite happiness. That's a Buddhistic solution, right? But where does, yes. that, where does that leave the other human beings? They are still in suffering. And Srivamdu's point is that you really want to be only individually free? Are you not bothered about the others who are suffering? Mm. That's his point. Yeah. And also, we have a spiritual experience where you feel that in the cosmic consciousness, I am with everybody. Everybody is in me and I am in everybody. The cosmic consciousness. So, if I get liberated and the others remain in ignorance, is it not a very selfish spiritual aim? Why should we not have a more wide-minded and more generous spiritual aim of liberating others also? Well, this is uh, my feeling exactly, but I, wa I want to ask you, was this the primary reason for Tamasic attitude in India in those earlier days? Uh, no, the, I would say it is tamasic, but I would say that it is an individual aim. And it was much... In, uh, okay, let's get back to the original. In the Vedic period, this was not the aim. Yes, of course. The Vedic period was very, very clear that everything is divine. Okay? There is... 
the suffering and the falsehood and the evil that you see in the physical world is a surface phenomenon. It's a surface phenomenon. If you go to the spiritual level of consciousness, you see that good and evil are really the same poles of the same vibration. There is no essential difference between them. Okay? If you are going to have suffering, one sometime or other you will have you will have pleasure also. And if you have pleasure, sometime or other you are also bound to have pain. So this is the dualities. So, to escape the dualities, Buddhism came with this idea. And the Vedic period, the truth of the Vedic period, <laughs> that spirit and matter are one, slowly got covered over and the Buddhistic solution imposed itself on the Indian mind. And also there was another, politically also, the conquests of others, also, sort of you went away, you got distance from your own uh, spiritual aim. Okay? So, this was the solution. So, it had to be revived. The entire aim, the aim of the Vedic period had to be revived. And that is exactly what Srinidhi is doing now. Okay? Uh. Yeah. That was the whole idea. That the world is part of you and you are part of the world. So, when you are liberating yourself, you are not helping the world. So, a wider, a more um, wide and generous view would be that you liberate yourself by all means. But you also try to liberate the others. And how can that be done? By bringing down the next principle over the mind. So, you bring it down, you bring down the super mind and take the general evolution to the next step. That was the whole idea. Thank you. Thank you. So, now we go back to the beginning of what he is saying in this para. Or I can do one thing. I will give you the gist of what he is saying. Then we will go back to each word. So, Srinda is saying that the physical world can be seen in two ways. One is that the suffering and the pain that you see here is real and you have to get away from it. It is permanent. So, if the pain and suffering and evil and falsehood is real in the physical world, the divine life on earth is not possible. So, you have to escape from it and go away into the infinite or the higher planes of consciousness. Okay? So, this is what Sindhu is saying. Then you are a Buddhist. But Srimadhu says there is another way of looking at the physical world. That the suffering, pain and evil are not permanent. He is saying that they are not permanent. They can be taken. There is an evolution in the physical world. So he is seeing it in that way. So instead of escaping from the pain and suffering, we have to become master of the pain and suffering. That is what he is saying. Okay? So, so now, I go back to each the, uh, sentence and we will see what he is saying. So, but, if accepting this side of nature, this side of nature is the evil, falsehood and suffering. Okay? This side of nature. We say, if we say that all things are fixed in their statutory and stationary law of being, what he means is, that there is suffering and pain and evil are the very nature of the physical world and there is no escaping from them. They are permanent. If you say that, then what is the choice left to man? The choice left to man is only to escape from it. So, you yes. have the Buddhistic solution and you have the Mayavadic solution. Okay? So. His ignorance and sin and weakness and vileness and suffering our life loses its true significance. What is meant is that if that is the truth, that the pain and suffering is eternal here, why at all come down here at all? Why do you want to put yourself into pain and suffering permanently? It's ridiculous. Why, why was the physical world made of permanent suffering and pain? The life has no meaning then. 
Okay? That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Man's perpetual attempt to arise out of the darkness and insufficiency of his nature can then have no issue in the world itself. You can't find a solution to pain, suffering and evil in the physical world because it is permanent. So the only choice you have is to escape. Okay? So. <coughs> it's one issue if there is any. Okay? There are some who say that there is no issue, there is no possibility at all. That's the, uh, the existentialism. The existentialism says that this is the nature of the physical world. You have to accept it quietly. There is no escape. Okay? That's one. But if others can say, no, there is an escape. That's the Buddhist and the Mayavadic solution. You can escape from it. It's not that you have to accept the world as it is permanently. You can escape. Okay? So, it's one issue if the world is unreal, uh, if the world is full of suffering, if there is any, must be by an escape out of life, out of the world, out of his human existence, and therefore out of his eternally unsatisfactory law of imperfect being, either into a heaven of the gods, or of God, or into the pure ineffability of the absolute. So, once you escape, you have got many choices. You can either disappear into the infinite, or you can live with God in the higher planes of consciousness. Okay? All these are possible. There are many, many worlds in the spiritual worlds. There is the <coughs> Brahma Loka, there is the Ananda Loka, there is the Brahma Loka, Ananda Loka, Vijjana Loka. There are so many Lokas. Okay? So you can live in many one of them. So that is also a choice to the to the um, to the soul which is escaping from the physical world. So that's what Sandhu is saying. Okay, so if so, okay, man can never really deliver out of the ignorance and falsehood the truth and knowledge, out of the evil and ugliness, the good and beauty, out of the weakness and vileness, the power and glory, out of the grief and suffering, the joy of delight which are contained in the spirit behind them and of which these contradictions are the first adverse and contrary conditions of emergence. So, he is saying, I can look at the world in a different way. I can see behind the suffering, hiding in the, behind the suffering is the bliss. Hiding behind the ignorance is the knowledge. Hiding behind the falsehood, the truth. So, I don't agree with the Buddhistic solution of escaping. If the truth is here behind the ignorance, if there is happiness behind the suffering, then I can transmute it. It should be possible to transmute it. I will take it in that sense. That's what Sindhi is saying. Okay? So, <clears throat> all he can do, so if he can't accept that, all he can do is to cut the imperfections away from him and overpass to their balancing opposites. In other words, if you are escaping, you are escaping from suffering as well as bliss. You are escaping from ignorance as well as knowledge. You are escaping from falsehood as well as truth. That's it. That's the solution for the Buddhists and the Mahavadins. Okay, so all he can do is to cut the imperfections away from him and overpass to their balancing opposites. Imperfect also. Balancing opposites, the duality, right? Truth and falsehood. Okay, in conscience and consciousness, okay, so, knowledge and ignorance, <clears throat> all these you are leaving. Leave with the ignorance the human knowledge, with the evil the human good, with the weakness the human strength and power, with the strife and suffering the human love and joy. For these are in our present nature inseparably entwined together, look like conjoint dualities the negative pole and the positive pole of the same unreality and since they cannot be elevated and transformed, they must both be abandoned. He is giving you this uh, Buddhistic philosophy. Okay? Humanity cannot be fulfilled in divinity. Divine life on earth is not possible according to the Buddhists and the Mayavadins. It must cease, be left behind and rejected. Whether the result 
will be an individual enjoyment of the absolute divine nature or of the divine presence or a nirvana in the featureless absolute is a point on which religions and philosophies differ. So some people say, go back into the infinite. Some say, no, live in the spiritual fields with the divine presence. Okay, so all different ideas are there. Each one is different. The Sankhya philosophy, the Mayavada philosophy, the um, the uh, the leela, the, the the play of the divine is the leela. So all these different solutions are there. Okay, if you accept the escape. The soul by taking on manhood, perhaps by the very fact of birth itself, has fallen from the divine, has committed an original sin or error, which it must be man's spiritual aim, as soon as it is enlightened, to thoroughly, to cancel unflinchingly, unflinchingly to eliminate. So the whole paragraph here is a description of the <coughs> is a description of the Buddhistic philosophy and the Mayavadi philosophy. Okay? So, there is no possibility here of the divine life on earth, so you have to only escape from it. The Srivanda will now tell you in the next paragraph, he will tell you that no, there can be another way of looking at things. Okay? So, <clears throat> so I'll do one thing. I am reading the summary of what he has said in this paragraph. Okay? So, If it be held, I am reading the summary of what he is saying here. If it be held that this world of imperfection is condemned to be eternally the same without any way out of it, then man has only one solution and that is to escape suffering. Okay? He must escape from this unreality and enter into the higher heavens where imperfection does not exist. What those heavens are differs from one religion to another. But what is certain is that no divine life is possible on earth which must remain eternally the permanent matrix of imperfection. This is basically what he is saying. Okay? So that's his solution. So, it is valid for those who want to just escape. But for Sri it's not enough because he is thinking of all the others who are, the world will remain permanently imperfect. But Sri can't accept that. He says there is an evolution and it is possible to slowly eliminate also suffering and pain and evil and falsehood. So, I read the next one. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> In that case, the only reasonable explanation of such a paradoxical manifestation or creation is that it is a cosmic game, a leela, a play, an amusement of the divine being. It may be, he pretends to be undivine, wears that appearance like a mask or makeup of an actor for the sole pleasure of the pretense or the drama. Or else, he has created the undivine, created ignorance, sin and suffering, just for the joy of a manifold creation. Or perhaps, as some religions curiously suppose, he has done this so that there may be inferior creatures who will praise and glorify him for his eternal goodness, wisdom, bliss and omnipotence and try feebly to come an inch nearer to the goodness in order to share the bliss on pain of punishment by some supposed eternal if, as the vast majority must by their very imperfection, they fail in their endeavour. But to the doctrine of such a leela, so cruelly stated, so sorry, so cruel, crudely stated, there is always the possible, there is always possible the retort that a god himself all blissful, who delights in the suffering of creatures or imposes such suffering on them for the faults of his own imperfect creation, would be no divinity, and against him the moral being and intelligence of humanity must revolt or deny his existence. But if the human soul is a portion of the divinity, 
if it's a divine spirit in man that puts on this imperfection and in the form of humanity in the form of humanity consents to bear this suffering or if the soul in humanity is meant to be drawn to the divine spirit and is his associate in the play of imperfections here in the delight of perfect being otherwise other where the leela may still remain a paradox but it ceases to be a cruel and devoting paradox it can at most be regarded as a strange mystery and to the reason inexplicable to explain it there must be two missing elements a conscious assent by the soul to this manifestation and a reason in the all wisdom that makes the place significant and intelligible so he is now discussing the consequences of the if this theory i am reading the summary of what he said here if this theory of eternal imperfection in the world is accepted then some explanations that could be offered are he is saying one of the some of the solutions it's a leela it's a play of the divine an amusement of the divine he pretends to be undivine masks himself as an actor for the pleasure of the drama so this is one explanation may not be a very satisfactory explanation but it's an explanation okay simply examining all the possibilities second solution or perhaps he has created evil suffering and imperfection because he must create infinitely in this manifold universe so because his power is there infinite he goes on creating everything and this also is automatically created that also is not a very satisfactory explanation because he is creating the opposite of his own nature so that is also not acceptable third solution or as some religions curiously suppose he has created inferior creatures men who are in ignorance who will praise and glorify him in order to come nearer to him but all these fail in the end to do so so this is another one that he is creating this is a very anthropomorphic idea that i create lower ones so that they can appreciate me surely if such a god is there he is most imperfect so all these solutions are not satisfactory at all okay so but this doctrine of leela is open to the retort that a god who creates imperfection to enjoy it is no god at all okay a god who enjoys other suffering is himself perverse but if we posit that the human soul is part of the divine and puts on this imperfection willingly then the charge of perversity vanishes okay you yourself you are the divine soul and you have come down here and you have agreed to come down into pain and suffering then the divine is not perverse that charge of divine being perverse disappears the paradox still lingers and needs two suppositions to bring a reasonable solution so <clears throat> one solution you yourself have agreed to come down into this suffering you have to explain why but that's one possibility the second is a very valid reason in the divine wisdom that makes manifestation meaningful and significant you are not seeing the purpose of the creation of suffering and falsehood but there is an intention so you have to find out what that intention is this is what he is saying in the in this para narad yes i am hearing yeah it is clear it's very clear but uh, i think he's going to go with a new paragraph now and tell us how that doesn't work okay so if we take the if we bring the idea in that man himself is essentially divine and he has agreed to come down into the world of suffering and pain and evil then you can't say that the divine is perverse you yourself have agreed to this game okay so if that is the theory if that is the hypothesis with which we start then the strangeness of the play diminishes the paradox loses its edge of sharpness if we discover that although fixed grades exist 
each with its appropriate order of nature, they are only firm steps for a progressive ascent of the souls embodied in being in forms of matter, a progressive divine manifestation which rises from the inconscient to the superconscient or all conscient status with the human consciousness as its decisive point of transition. Imperfection becomes then a necessary term of the manifestation. For since all the divine nature is concealed but present in the inconscient, it must be gradually delivered out of it. This graduation necessitates a partial unfolding and this partial character or incompleteness of the unfolding necessitates imperfection. An evolutionary manifestation demands a mid-stage with gradations above and under it. Precisely such a stage as the mental consciousness of man, part knowledge, part ignorance, a middle power of being still leaning on the inconscient but slowly rising towards the all-conscious divine nature. A partial unfolding implying imperfection and ignorance may take as its inevitable companion, perhaps its basis for certain movements, an apparent perversion of the original truth of being. For the ignorance and imperfection to endure, there must be a seeming contrary of all the character of all that characterizes the human nature, its unity, its all consciousness, its all power, its all harmony, its all good, its all delight. There must appear limitation, discord, unconsciousness, disharmony, incapacity, insensibility and suffering, evil. For without that perversion, imperfection could have no strong standing ground, could not so freely manifest and maintain its nature as against the presence of the underlying divinity. A partial knowledge is imperfect knowledge and imperfect knowledge is to that extent ignorance, a contrary of the divine nature. But in its outlook on what is beyond its knowledge, this contrary negative becomes a contrary positive. It originates error, wrong, wrong knowledge, wrong dealing with others, with life, with action. The wrong knowledge becomes a wrong will in the nature. At first, it may be wrong by mistake, but afterwards wrong by choice, by attachment, by mm. delight in the falsehood. The simple contrary turns into a complex perversion. In conscience and ignorance, once admitted, these form a natural result in a logical sequence and have to be admitted also as necessary factors. The only question is the reason why this kind of progressive manifestation was itself necessary. That is the sole point left obscure to be to the intelligence. So, it's pretty uh, complex. We have got five minutes. So, what I'll do, I'll read the summary of what he's saying. Okay, so good, it, good. May, it may help. Okay. In the manifestation, there's an evolution which is graded from complete consciousness to complete nations. There are grades in between and the evolution proceeds upwards step by step. The divine is hidden, latent in matter and reveals himself in slow steps. One of these grades is precisely the human consciousness. It stands between the two poles, <coughs> the pole of total consciousness and inconscience. It has some consciousness and some nations. The human consciousness is partly this, partly that. It is partly in knowledge and partly in ignorance. It is precisely this partial knowledge that brings imperfection with all its consequences. Suffering, evil, discord, etc. Now, if the imperfection is to endure, there must be a starting point of seeming contraries. 
Okay. In this gradation, if mind sees above its own partial knowledge, then what is below it seems to be not seeming contraries, but positive contraries. Truth becomes falsehood, at first by mistake, but later by choice and attachment. Simple contraries become complex perversions. Now, the only question that remains is, why was this progressive manifestation at all necessary? Okay. That's what he said in the para. So, we'll discuss it next time. We have only three minutes left and we will not be able to do justice to it. So, okay. So, Wonderful. Okay. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for attending.